afternoon, folks. Thanks for joining. Um, I had the title up for this session. I just want to make sure folks got on the right airplane today before we take off. So the title for this panel, uh, paper panel is Equity, Humility, Capacity Building, and Decolonization. I had this problem yesterday. Decolonality. I still can't do it. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, we have two presenters today, Set Lodge and Emily. Uh, we're going to start with Set Lodge. Oh, I should introduce myself. I'm Sylvia Epps. I'm COO of Decision Information Resources, a uh, research firm in Houston, Texas. Um, and I am also a CREA affiliate researcher. Um, okay. Back to our, our the, why we're here today. We're going to start with Set Lodge um, and have please introduce yourself uh, when you get going. And then we'll, we'll spend about 15 to 20 minutes on that presentation. Please feel free to raise your hand for clarifying questions, put them in the chat during the conversation. So, uh, Set Lodge, I will let you know if there's something that comes up during your talk um, that I think we should stop and have you clarify. Same for you, Emily. Um, and then we'll use a time at the end for open discussion. All right, um, let's get going. I'll turn this over to Set Lodge. Hi, everybody. I'm Set Lodge, Set Lodge DK. I work at University of North Carolina at Wilmington. And this is, so I'll be playing. So this, uh, actually, Rosetta is going to play my pre recorded session. But the topic of this session is decolonizing evaluation capacity building in. Um, and you know, it, it critically examine colonization and decolonization of evaluation capacity building. This is based on my dissertation research that I recently conducted in India. So I'm really happy and really excited to see all folks here. And maybe let's get started with the recorded piece. And if you have any questions, please put them in the chat or um, please raise them. And in the question answer session, I'll be happy to take them. So thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Satlaj Dike. I work at University of North Carolina, Wilmington. And today I'm going to present on this topic, decolonizing evaluation capacity building in the global south. So let's take, first take a look at today's agenda. First, I will start with overview of this research, research questions, research methods. Then we will try to understand what is evaluation capacity building and what, why it is important for the global south organization. Then we will move on to understanding what is decolonization of ECB, what is colonization of evaluation capacity, how do I interpret it in the context of this research. And the last but significant section of this conversation will be focused on the what's, the why's, and how's of colonization of evaluation capacity building. So let's talk about the research background. This research was actually part of my dissertation research. And my dissertation research was focused on question, how do community-based health organizations in India build their evaluation capacity to do and use evaluation? And a lot of data themes that emerged from this conversation aligned very closely with the themes of decolonization and cultural responsive evaluation. So I also analyze data with the decolonization lens, and that part of the research is, is shared in this presentation. The overall research methods of uh, the, the dissertation research uh, was that this research was, was implemented with the help of eight community-based health organizations in India. And these were the these organizations were identified based on certain criteria, and these criteria were demonstrated interest and experience in evaluation. And that I determined with the help of scoping interviews, uh, reaching out to my network, looking at their website, looking at their evaluation reports to make sure that they have certain experience in doing and using evaluation. Then all of these organizations, eight organizations, were working on the issues of health education, health access, and health rights. So they were not the one directly providing health services, but they were mostly involved with the marginalized communities to ensuring health access and health as human rights. 
Uh, then they were had direct collaboration with rural communities. So they were not a donor organization or research organization, but implementing organization with work with rural communities. The annual budget of these organizations were somewhere between $50,000 to $200,000 US dollars, which in Indian terms could be like a medium level nonprofit. And the number of employees for in this organization ranged from 10 to 30 people. There was no specific geographical focus, but I choose organizations from these states of Maharashtra, Gujarat, and Jharkhand. I mean, they happen to be in these states because yes. a, they, they first um, they uh, um, they followed the criteria that I listed that I shared just um, uh, about, and also because. I wanted people, these the data collection methods were in-depth interviews and I wanted people to be really comfortable with the language that they're speaking. And I'm comfortable with the language of these three states. And that's why I identified organizations from, from these states. The data collection methods were semi-structured interview, in-depth interviews, and each interview lasted around 90 minutes and also document reviews. And again, documents involved like quarterly reviews, annual reviews, their evaluation reports, if any research or action research projects they have done, um, anything, any document that demonstrated evaluative thinking. So the scope was really broad uh, because I did not want them to narrow down to a very formal evaluation, which they often, most often, they used to, the community based organization used to interpret as either pre-post studies or RCTs, I wanted to have some evidence that goes beyond that. The research participants were of three categories. 10, 13 were organizational leaders and middle managers, then 10 were entry-level program staff, and seven were independent evaluators who were working with, with community-based health organization for the last 10 to 15 years. So now next step, let's take a look at what is evaluation capacity building. Evaluation capacity building is defined, the most accepted, broadly accepted definition is by Stockdale and it says the intentional work to create and sustain overall organizational processes that make a quality evaluation and its use as routine. So this involves learning and teaching activities for individual and groups but also creating structures, processes, and policies that hold and houses evaluation and make the, make the users of evaluation routine. And ECB outcomes at a very broad level can be, can be categorized as um, increased individual and organizational evaluation knowledge and skills, positive attitude towards evaluation, less fear, less anxiety, and also enhanced engagement in evaluation activities. That means more evaluation activity in the organization. And the evaluation capacity building is use, is important for Global South organization or for that matter, any implementing organization because it empowers them to ask questions that matters to them. Not the question that matters to donor, but the questions that are useful for their growth and their future trajectory. It also enhances evaluation use beyond accountability and donor reporting purposes. So if implementing organization has skills to do evaluation, they can use it for many diverse purposes. They can use it, they can be creative and they can use evaluation to solve their problems, to address questions that are relevant for them. And that overall improves, enhances the use of evaluation. Thirdly, it reduces reliance and cost related to external evaluators. You all know that evaluation is expensive. So this is really useful for this organization to build internal capacity so that there is not only continuity in the evaluation, but it, they can also have the low cost approach toward evaluation. And they can then they can do it more often. And fourth, and maybe most importantly for other people is that Evaluation capacity at the grassroots organization advances sectoral understanding of grassroots level social change. Because when this organization that are closer to action, when they learn, understand, and engage in evaluative thinking about how the social change happened, their learnings are transferred 
to the entire sector. And as a, as a result, we all learn from it. And let's then move to why there is need to decolonize ACD. There is a lot of research and evaluate, experiences of evaluators that, that shows us that evaluation field in the global South is heavily influenced by donors. Donors decide what to evaluate, how to evaluate, and why to evaluate. There is also a disconnect between evaluation and program improvement and evaluation and learning. There is, there is this feeling in the global South that evaluation is not working out for them. It, they do evaluation, they submit reports to donors, but they don't really use it because they cannot make connection between evaluation findings and their needs. And that's why they cannot use it for their learning or you know, for their design, program improvement and planning. There is also limited voice and agency to implementing organization in the process of evaluation, decision-making and design. Most of the time, the role of implementing organization is, is restricted to data collection and very minor analysis, but they don't have understanding or idea or, or, or say in what questions we are asking what needs of our stakeholder communities are reflected in the evaluation design, how the evaluation is need to be followed up, how we can build future programs based on this evaluation. Most of the time, they don't really have any, any stake in this process. And which basically is evaluation colonization. We can see that Hobson, defines evaluation colonization as determination of merit or worth that are defined from a non-indigenous and often geographically and culturally distant perspective and applied to indigenous persons and programs without regard to local culture and values. Many other scholars have also elaborated on the themes of evaluation colonization and what we can learn from them that evaluation is colonizing when it reinforces existing power asymmetries it frames evaluation design in a top-down manner, limiting participation from stakeholder communities, and it relies exclusively on Western knowledge system to validate its method, findings, and learnings. And in recent years, many scholars and evaluators have advocated for the need of cultural responsive methods to, to implement evaluation. Many have come up with indigenous evaluation frameworks, which are really important and which have taken this field ahead. And which is very important to, to implement and integrate this evaluation, indigenous evaluation frameworks in the evaluation design. But I, I, what I want to add in this conversation is that while it is important to have indigenous evaluation frameworks, it is also critical to examine to inter interrogate our mainstream methodologies because our mainstream methodologies still embed persistent Eurocentrism. Our frameworks, choices, main methods that we use are still originated from the Western knowledge system and that there is a Euro, they are Eurocentric. And what we need to do for that is to what we need to do for decolonizing evaluation is to uncover this Eurocentrism, the biases, omissions, and assumptions that we make from Eurocentric perspective and try to see evaluation process, try to unearth it from more local perspective. And what it will involve for, for evaluation capacity building is to uncover the purpose for which the asking questions like, what is the purpose for which evaluation capacity is built? For whom it is built and how it is built? And for rest of this, uh, this presentation, I will focus on these three questions and why do we need to answer them in order to decolonize evaluation? Let's first talk about purpose. Again, many there is a lot of research studies that demonstrate that the evaluation in the Global South is mainly implemented for the purposes of accountability, reporting, and monitoring. So basically to answer the questions like, are we doing what we said we would do? 
The second, the research is also showing that there is a lot of uh, new wave of uh, evaluation, which are mainly impact evaluation. But again, this impact is defined from the perspective of donors. It is the attribution and contributions questions related to donor resources that are being uh, examined in the impact evaluation. That is not the impact from the point of view of the doer organizations or stakeholder communities. And thirdly, many of these studies and especially research studies are that uh, research studies that are implemented as, as part of RCTs, experimental quasi-experimental studies are focused on validating donors' theories and claims. And two of the quotes that emerged from the, from the data that I collected really uh, highlighted this point. One of the organizational leader and evaluators said that evaluation planning in our organization happens through formats, not frameworks. The donors gives us a format, we are supposed to fill it. We don't get chance to internalize the design, learn the rationale behind it, and build on it. And the second uh, person, uh, a very experienced organizational leader with 30 plus years experience in the field, he, he pointed out what, what kind of funders there are. And he said that there are three types of funders in the Indian public health. One type is interesting in validating their point. They have made up their minds. They just want to prove the point. These people do RCDs. Then there are people, funders who only want to validate their outcomes. These funders work with McKinsey car people. They're mainly interested in numbers, not learning from the evaluation. And then there is third type who genuinely want to learn, but they are rare. So again, bringing to the point that it's not like that there are no donors that who don't want to engage in eva learning from evaluation, but there are very few in numbers. The second question that we wanted to ask is for whom evaluation capacity building is designed. Again, this research and other research shows that the evaluation capacity building workshops, trainings are mainly organized for donor staff or employees of implementing organization who are working on donor related evaluation. And the audience for these workshops and trainings are mainly English speaking urban communities in big cities. And one participant, one of uh, 20 year old, her, her words kind of stayed with me because it really highlighted well the evaluation resource gap, not evaluation knowledge resource gaps between implementing organizations and donors or in the universities. And she said, I collect data all the time, but I want to know what lies beyond data collection. What happens to the data I collect? How I can make good reports and use it in my work? And this is one example, one quote, but all the field level staff, the 10 entry level people in the program, all of them express the same feeling that they want to learn about evaluation, but they are A, not able to use the evaluation in their work. And secondly, they don't have access to evaluation trainings and activities where they can learn more about evaluation and then you know, again, use it in, in their work. And that highlighted um, a major gap between evaluation, training, and resource availability for grassroots levels and cities in India. And third is how the ECB is built and what are the challenges that are faced by field-based organization. The field-based organization shared that firstly, workshops and trainings are expensive. They are really out of the capacity or the budget of these organizations. There were high admission fees. Then they are organized in metro cities away from field level organizations. So that, again, they have to travel there, which makes them expensive. And many of these, or most all of these trainings are implemented, are conducted in English, the language that is in, in, inaccessible to many field level workers. Evaluation coordinator of one, for example, she, she kind of really illustrated this point here. And she said the availability of evaluation resource person is extremely limited because we can't call people from outside. We cannot afford to pay their travel. In Delhi, you will get many resource people, but not in Mumbai. It is the same case with evaluation trainings. Most of the trainings and workshops happen in Delhi. We have to pay the course fee plus travel. Then it becomes expensive. This is the limitation. And 
the organization uh, she was representing, that was not even a small organization, a very small organization. It was like really big reputed organization based in Mumbai, a big city. So if they are facing resource portion crunch, scarcity in the city like Mumbai, and if the, the course fees and travel if they're outside of their budget, we cannot imagine the situation of you know, the organizations that are based in second tier, third tier cities in India or in the rural towns, these trainings were really out of their reach. The same, the, again, there's also always the, the question of resources. And many people, many people told me that there is like there is not really a budget for evaluation. Donors don't really want to budget for evaluation. Many donors want implementing organizations to conduct RCTs or quasi-experimental studies, but they don't really want to invest in the phase, the planning phase, and also capacity building phase for then, you know, the, which then enable the field staff to implement this, these studies. Uh, for example, one organizational leader here said the main challenge for building an evaluation system is money. That's because it does not produce any outcomes for organization. Hence, the people think that it is, it is what is the value in building the evaluation system. Small organizations cannot do this on their own. If they have a good network, they can take care of some aspects of evaluation. Otherwise, they cannot do anything. And the second aspect that was explained by many evaluators that is the shifting donor priorities and shrinking timelines. Earlier, they said like 10 years earlier, the program or project timelines were around five years, but now they have come down to three years, even two years. And it is really difficult to design a project, implement it, and then arrive at some meaningful learning in the span of two years. Evaluators also mentioned that there is always shifting donors' priorities, and these donor priorities do not happen in the bottom up way. They are not um, de decided uh, with the stakeholder communities or after the consultation sessions with the organization, implementing organization and communities. They're mainly top down. And then what happens that the organization build their capacity for once in the one specific area, but then they're always at the risk of change the, the donors changing this priority area in the next funding cycle. And that reduces their motivation to invest in capacity building. One independent evaluator uh, articulated this point really well, and I will read this quote here. Uh, she said, if I work on one program area, but if in the next funding cycle, the funding is for a completely different area, then what I can do? If my organization worked on adolescent health for three years, and then donor decided to give funding for maternal health, then all my adolescent health-related learnings are futile because strategies of change for adolescent health are very different for maternal health. Yes, there could be some high-level learning, but the learning specific to the program area, the nuances of strategies get lost. And this is really this top-down approach of changing shift, uh, priorities, shifting program focus, is exactly the example of colonization of evaluation. The other ways that colonization of evaluation is reflected in evaluation capacity building is the lack of attention to cultural competencies. Many of the global South countries are actually multilingual, multi-ethnic, multiracial countries, really heterogeneous countries. But the amount of conversation that happens on cultural competency is really, really limited. There is a lot of research and a lot of conversation, a lot of awareness in the global, not about cultural competencies, but in the global South. And I mean, my experiences are mainly for India, but I also worked in other countries. And what I've experienced that most of the time, cultural competencies equated with the familiarity with language. Anybody who can understand the language can claim cultural competency, but that is not enough, that is not exactly the cultural competency. All the evaluators who were part of this study said that what makes difference as evaluator is their ability to understand local context. Because any project, any government or international development project or any NGO project, when it is implemented in villages, in rural communities, it is mired in politics. 
people have different views about it. Some people think it works, some people think it did not. You need to understand the dynamics and try to make a sense of what is happening there. And it's not about who is telling truth versus lies, but it's mostly about how different groups are understanding uh, the, this work and what are their reflections, what their opinions. And for that, you really need to have very nuanced power understanding, dynamics between two castes, two political parties, two, two regions. And for that, you need local evaluators, evaluators who have who knows the culture well, who knows the values well, and also understand evaluation. And then they can build that understanding and which basically that improves the quality of evaluation, that improves the accuracy of data. And if this is lacking, the evaluations are essential of inferior quality. And a third way where the colonization is reflected in the in the evaluation capacity building is that the methods and the, the training that the, we, or the methodical training that we give and they are all eurocentric methods and it's there is a lack of ability to develop indigenous approaches and this lack of ability is there because the evaluation training is never approached from this lens the, the evaluation training doesn't encourage people to engage in critical thinking in interrogating current practices and to build new practices. And Zinda often makes this point when she says, the indigenous development of indigenous evaluation framework is not about cultural sensitivity, but rather about the fundamental questioning of worldviews, frameworks, and definitions on which evaluation theory and practice and resultant development have been built. And that brings us to the way forward. What is the way forward for decolonizing evaluation capacity building in the global south? And for me, the first thing is need for decentralized and cultural responsive evaluation capacity building. And again, in very simple terms, what it means to me is that availability of evaluation training and resources in the regional languages. And I'll just make this point with the statistics that I've got. Uh, population of the state of Maharashtra in India, whose, um, whose, whose main language, whose lang official language is Marathi, is 114 million. But the evaluation training course that is available in Marathi is just one. And this is the state that I come from. So I really dig, really deep to find out if there are any evaluation courses in my language. There is only one. And the population is 140 million. And that th this kind of highlights the gap in the availability of evaluation resources in regional languages. And there is also the need to eliminate urban bias. Evaluation capacity building need to happen for stakeholder communities, not only urban, higher educated, English speaking middle class, but also where the social change work is happening. The other thing that we constantly need to engage in is in contestation. We need to identify and uncover Eurocentrism at the level of theory and practice of ECB, hold this conversation in professional evaluation organizations, in higher institutions, in the forums like this. We need to continue to do that. We also need to collaborate, and there is a lot of potentials for collaborating with donors, with international organizations to create and disseminate evaluation resources in regional languages. Donors and implementing organizations can collaborate together to build mutually useful evaluation designs. And national and regional universities, resource organizations can also take lead to build evaluation capacity at regional and local level. There is need of partnership and collaboration between all these actors so that evaluation capacity can be built from bottom up. And thirdly, we need to engage in conversations about values and power dynamics behind our methodological choices and evaluation framework. Evaluators in Global South need to engage in, in critically interrogating the methods that we are using. Are they, are they perpetuating inequity? Are they perpetuating lack of capacity? Are we creating knowledges? Uh, are we creating frameworks that are really well suited 
for the circumstances in which the reality in which the evaluations are implemented? We need to ask these questions. Again, as I said, we need to uncover assumptions, omissions, and biases that we make in our practice. And lastly, we need to understand the sources of expression of evaluative thinking in the local culture, how evaluation is understood and interpreted in local terms. And we need to build evaluation practice based on these cultural terms so that it could be relevant, useful, and meaningful for the implementing organization and field labor worker who are engaged in the social change work. So that's what I, all I have. And thank you for your interest in this presentation. And I'm looking forward to questions. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Any um, immediate burning questions um, for clarification? I have some myself, but I will, I will hold on to the end. Any clarification questions? Okay, great. Um, let's move on and um, move on to Emily. Emily, will you tell us who you are and introduce your paper and uh, Rosetta will get your video going. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Emily and I use she, her pronouns. And I just wanna say thank you to uh, Salt Ledge. That was a great presentation. And I feel like I have so many parallels in mind too. So it's really cool to see how they're um, you know, similar and also learning about that context. Maybe it was fantastic. So really appreciate it. Um, so I'm from the Evaluation Center at CU Denver and I won't um, do too much talking right now because I think it's all in my presentation. <laughs> so I don't wanna be just double speaking. Um, and reiterating myself, but um, my presentation is on our SEED program, which is our pro bono services that we provide for local nonprofits. And yeah, just really excited to be here <laughs> with everyone, even virtually. I wish we were in person, but such is life. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Hecker and I use she, her pronouns. I'm very excited and honored to be a part of CREA and learning with you all here. I'm an evaluation specialist at the Evaluation Center, which is housed in the University of Colorado at Denver. And my presentation today is about our SEED program. SEED stands for Cultivating Evaluation, Education and Development. So a little bit of background of the Evaluation Center. We are a not-for-profit entity housed in a major research university and we operate with fee for service The organization was created in 2004 and we currently have 14 full-time staff and eight graduate assistants. Over the last five years as an organization, we've been really intentionally and continuously learning to incorporate culturally responsive and equitable evaluation practices into our work. We've been doing that in a number of different ways. Um, we are currently working with an external facilitator for not only our evaluation work, but also helping us improve our internal work culture and work environment. At the current moment, this entails engaging with them in race-based caucusing. What we really want to do is work to dismantle the white supremacist and patriarchal practices and systems that we unintentionally have just as a result of being a part of the society that we live in. We're also engaging in webinars and trainings to learn different evaluation practices, methods, and ways of thinking. We know that there's a lot out there that we might not have learned through our evaluation and educational training, which of course stems from the system of white supremacy. We know that this work takes time and is never ending, but we are committed to continue moving forward on our journey and improving ourselves, our organization, and our work. So what is the SEED program? This is our pro bono program that provides 75 hours of evaluation services over the course of about four to eight months to selected local nonprofits. Considering our hourly rate, this comes out to about $9,000. Since 2017, five SEED projects with five different local nonprofits have been completed. When the SEED program was created in 2017, there were three main goals. We really wanted to build relationships with local nonprofits, increase the value and usefulness of evaluation in our communities by increasing partner organizations' knowledge of evaluation and building their evaluation capacity. 
We also wanted to develop the new pipeline of junior staff who lead the projects, along with the mentorship and support from more senior evaluators to ensure quality and rigor. In the most recent round, we really saw an opportunity to use the SEED program in a more intentional way to really focus on equitable evaluation. In that shift, the SEED goals also shifted. We really wanted to build relationships with local nonprofits that represent the needs of historically unserved, underserved, or inappropriately served communities. We also wanted to focus on shifting the power of knowledge production to our partners and decolonize the expertise of evaluation by helping to build their internal evaluation capacity. In addition, we want to develop the pipeline of new evaluators who view equitable evaluation practices as integral to the work. And in general, we want our entire team to co-learn with our seed communities to continuously challenge us to consider what it means to be equitable evaluators. During the 2020 seed recruitment cycle, we were very intentional in our outreach application and selection process. We specifically sought out local organizations who are interested in exploring equity in their work, would otherwise not have the financial capacity to hire us, and organizations who are generally left out of traditional grant funding opportunities that allocate for or require evaluation. Once those local organizations were identified, we invited and encouraged only them to apply to the SEED program. Our application process is relatively accessible and consists of only a short online survey. The survey questions ask about the organization's mission and vision, size, funding streams, prior evaluation experience, and current interests in evaluation. After reviewing all the survey applications, we conducted interviews with selected organizations to get to know them and learn more about them. We didn't want the working relationship to be give and receive, but more of a collaboration or symbiotic relationship, which of course is more time intensive. We had to ensure our partner organization had enough internal time and human resources to partner with us. Ultimately, we decided to work with an organization run entirely by women of color fighting for reproductive rights and justice for the Latinx communities they serve. The organization we partnered with wanted to build their qualitative evaluation capacity. We collectively decided the best way to do that would be to evaluate one of their brand new youth education and leadership programs. Myself and my colleague Liz from the Evaluation Center worked directly with our partners. They identified two individuals from the organization who would work with us, their Director of Grants and Evaluations and their Program Manager. We first focused on relationship building. We had to collectively build trust and an understanding of what our partners wanted and needed from the evaluation work. We also had to make sure our capacity building activities were aligned with their unique needs and met them at their skill and resource levels. We then completed three qualitative training sessions with our partners, which were recorded and given to them for future reference. The trainings included hands-on examples of qualitative data collection and analysis, which we talked through to make sure we all had a shared understanding of the qualitative process. It was during the pandemic, so we used Zoom meetings and Google Docs as a way to effectively collaborate and work together. Over Zoom and shared Google Docs, we co-developed evaluation questions and evaluation plan and created interview instruments. Interviews and coding were completed doing a see one, participate, do one model. So Liz and I completed the first interview with our partners observing. We completed the second one together with our partners and they completed the final one on their own with us observing. After each interview, we all discussed interview methods and data interpretation to reflect on how the interview went and ways we could improve. Interview coding was completed similarly with the C1 participate do one model. Our partners decided they felt the most comfortable coding in Microsoft Word, so we collaboratively developed a process to code together using a shared Google Doc. We all learned a new way to complete qualitative coding using only Google Docs and an open communication stream using the comments function. It was imperative to us that our partners felt comfortable and confident to conduct a rigorous and quality driven qualitative evaluation but we simultaneously wanted to leave the door open for all of us to learn new methods, ways of thinking, and creativity. Throughout the process, it was clear that our partner's positionality as women of color was crucial in the design, data collection, and interpretation of findings. 
For example, through the collaborative instrument development process, we modified the original drafted questions so they were more relevant and resonated with our partners' community. I'm fluent in Spanish, but I'm not a native Spanish speaker, so I learned a lot from our partners when we translated the instrument into Spanish. This experience further solidified for me the importance of ensuring evaluations are led, or at the very least co-led, by individuals who are deeply embedded and a part of the community. From the themes in the coding, we wrote and completed a report our partners could use to disseminate the data and use as a template for any future reports. After our shared work came to an end, we of course wanted to learn more about how our partners felt about the SEED program, its usefulness to them, and where they might lead and continue the work into the future. We asked our partners to participate in a sort of exit interview with another member of the Evaluation Center team, not myself or Liz. Our partners shared with us that they gained a new perspective of and relationship with evaluation. They had some prior assumptions about what qualitative evaluation was, and the SEED program helped clarify their understanding of it. They noted that the experience was empowering because they were able to make their own decisions and build their confidence. Additionally, they had a very different experience working with us than with previous evaluators because we weren't as restrictive in our approaches and philosophies. They also noted how useful the final report was. They plan on using it to improve their programming and to pull content from it to share with donors and funders. It will also help in program recruitment and visibility, specifically to highlight their new youth programming by sharing via their social media pages to their communities. Finally, they talked about how they can use this experience to inform other evaluation efforts within their organization. They already had previous experience completing quantitative evaluation, but are excited to mesh in this qualitative evaluation to provide a richer picture of all of their efforts. They also plan on training other members of their team in qualitative evaluation so it can be valued and used throughout their organization. Looking toward the future, we want to continue intentionally partnering with our seed organizations and communities. We want to work with seed organizations and communities so they have the tools to tell their own stories to funders, policymakers, and their communities. This shifts the paradigm of academic discussions of racism and colonialism by putting at the forefront the values and experiences of communities that have not been fully included in this platform. We want to continue to co-learn with our seed communities and simultaneously develop the pipeline of new evaluators who view equitable evaluation practices as integral to the work. It also allows us as a team to internally reflect on our evaluation methods and practices by discussing our biases, methodologies, and knowledge creation processes in all of our projects. We also want to continuously improve the seed program. Before we begin our next round of the SEED program in 2022, we need to take the time as a team to be reflective. Maybe questions or comments that you all have after this presentation can be a launching point for our own reflection. In conclusion, throughout our most recent SEED round, we learned that being intentional and seeking out opportunities does not take much and allows us to be part of the solution. The SEED program became the intervention by giving this community organization the tools to decide their own value, measures, and outcomes, and amplify their own voices and stories in a way that matters to them. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Thank you, Emily. Um, any immediate clarifying questions for Emily? Okay, I'm going to share um, a couple of thoughts and then we will move to open discussion. Um, I see there's already one question in the chat from Fiona. Um, so let me first just say I really uh, appreciated um, what, uh, what you focused on in both of your papers. Um, I think you called it out, Emily, before you got started that there was some, some synergy between those, uh, your two um, presentations. What I found very interesting and I think both inspiring is that that Ledger's paper uh, highlighted what SEED is striving to do. Um, um, and it sort of 
is perhaps a model that can be um, replicated um, in an effort to try to start breaking down some of those barriers. And I say striving, uh, what CEDA is striving to do because evaluation capacity or lack thereof has very many layers to unpack. Um, and I don't think there's any way we can unpack all of them, um, but I do think that starting to peel back layers is definitely a great place to start. Um, for the first presentation, I really appreciated the attention to the barriers like budget, timing, cultural differences. Um, I think we all are completely aware that often folks who are asking for evaluation, regardless of why they're asking for it, they typically do not have enough funds allocated for it. Um, in addition, when it comes to timing, you know, evaluation tends to be an add-on. So, you know, I'm pretty sure lots of grant grantees have reached, they've reached out to DIR, I'm sure they've reached out to other, to folks um, on the screen asking for help with the report that's due to their funder um, six weeks before it's due at the end of their third year of their grant. And, you know, often we say, we can't help you. Like we want to help them, but we can't help them because um, we cannot do a due diligence and what we consider um, high quality evaluation at that point of implementation. And I think that uh, we've seen a lot of more attention lately to um, lifting up evaluation. But some of the things that Satlaj talked about in her uh, in her presentation is the reason um, why I think it's we'll continue to see things um, evaluation still you know become be an afterthought um, for a lot of organizations. Um, one more thing I'll say about the first paper is that, um, and this is a question for you to think about for the group to think about. Um, is, is what to do when research and evaluation is not a part of the DNA of the organization. Um, so if, if it is a part of the DNA um, of the organization, um, how are we able to unpack the authenticity of that evaluation? Is it just about metrics and a uh, report that the donors want to know about, or is it focused on the stakeholders in the community, um, learning, value add, feedback loops. Um, and what is our responsibility for um, getting organizations who uh, have a true and authentic desire to bring evaluation, um, to, to weave evaluation into their, into their DNA, but they really don't have the the budget, the, the buy-in from the leadership, um, like what, where does our responsibility as scholars who really care about you know, folks doing this well, um, but we, we can't work for free. Um, and I, uh, so I really appreciated Emily's paper, which gave us a model um, of which um, my answers start helping us answer that question. So for the paper two, um, really appreciated the intentionality and the approach. Um, I really appreciated the co-learning, the reflection, the awareness of the biases at the team, um, the evaluation team at SEED uh, maybe bringing to the project. Um, I think in an earlier presentation I did this morning, um, we were asked about uh, our own biases. And I think that the best we can do is acknowledge that we have them and tend to them, especially when they start creeping up in the in our work. Um, I like to call, I like to assign people to be my accountability partner that can call me out or pull my coattail, send me a Zoom, send me a, a text um, when I'm, I'm being insensitive or I'm, I'm being narrow-minded. Um, and that's one way I can, and I, sometimes I go into a meeting and say, okay, watch my eyes because I don't have a poker face. Um, but I've set these things up to keep myself in check and I ask other people to help me with that. So I found that, I found that really um, um, compelling that you guys have that as a part of your model. Um, one, a few questions I have for um, Emily and, and for the group is, is, what is your approach to building relationships? In particular, if you are an outsider, 
Um, and I think Emily, you mentioned um, you mentioned spending time building relationships. You know, if there are any examples of what that looks like when it works well and when it doesn't work well. Um, and I think that in general, um, this came up in, in a couple of sessions already. The but with tight budgets and tight timelines, um, adding time for relationship building is even more challenging. And so how do we strike that balance with making sure that we can build that in, make it efficient, and at the same time, have it start, start us off on the right foot, even if, even if we're brought in late to the game um, as evaluators, um, what, can, you know, what, what are some approaches that have worked and what, have some, what are some that have not? So thank you both. Again, I will uh, pause and ask for any reactions from either of you, and, and then we can go into um, the questions. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you, everybody. I'm really excited to be here. It was something that, you know, the planning of this started in 2020 and finally we are all here. So yep. this was a long wait, but worth it. So thank you. And I will answer your question. It's really, um, it's really important that you raise this, that what if the research is not part of DNA of organization? And I, I'm really happy you asked it because this was, something that I explored too, because all of the organizations that I studied were dual out organization, community-based organization that were involved in implementing. And many of research was not part of their, not for all of them. But what I see and what I understood from this is that even if research is not part of DNA, evaluative thinking is, when people work, they do think. And what as an evaluator we can do is to build tools for them, which they can integrate in their day-to-day -day work, day-to-day -day program. They don't have to have separate budget line for research. Research is expensive for small grassroots organization. And it is not of their interest too. I mean, we should not expect all the field-based organizations who want to engage in community work, who want to help people to have you know, research arm as well. Because And this is where, again, colonization comes in because it is expensive research. and and as we know, it is heavily colonized. You have to learn English, you have to write in English, you have to publish in English to get recognized for your research. But evaluative thinking, critical thinking, reflections are all of our faculties that are there in the grassroots. And as evaluator, I think our responsibility is to you help these folks to create and create tools so that they can use this, create evidence, create what's working for them, and then build their program with the consultation with the people they work with for future. So that's how I, I look at this problem. And this is really true. And should I take question by Fiona or Emily, sure, do you want sure. to fit in? Oh. Um, I can respond um, on the second question that uh, Sylvia had about relationship building. And I think, um, spending time learning with everyone at CREA this time. I've heard a lot about capitalism and I think the fact that we're a fee-for-service um, organization, we're kind of like grappling with that um, with that piece of like, you know, who holds the power, what do your clients want and how do you work in um, like CRE and equitable evaluation practices that are more time intensive and more costly. And I think for building relationships, how we think about it when we're like creating scopes or budgets that we've, you know, kind of started to um, work into is really like adding a line item for um, client meetings. And we say client meetings, but <laughs> I think in my head that's really like, yeah, the relationship building piece, but we think of it more as being thought partners. So like having, you know, however often you want to meet with, um, with your partners, it can be weekly, monthly, you know, however long the scope is, but really be thought partners for, for each other and thinking about like the evaluation and their work and how you can both build off of each other and work together and collaborate in that way. So I feel like that's how we've thought about it. But I, I mean, I know that we can improve that completely. And I think, um, I think just uh, spending as much time as possible and maybe budgeting more time for um, those meetings and working together than your client initially wants and, you know, kind of saying, well, but we really do need this time <laughs> and here's mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, so I'd say that would be my, my answer to that, but I would love other ideas and thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both for building those questions. Um, I think I've, I've had experience where there was a lot of pressure to do evaluation um, and folks were, you know, grappling with where to even start, but there was a, there was a real commitment to doing it uh, from leadership. Um, and we limped along, but, but because the commitment from leadership was there, you know, that I think they made some headway with making it a part of their DNA as an organization. And I think you're absolutely right, Emily, like you, it, it is a line item, we can call it whatever we want to call it. Um, but it is, it does need to be a line item. Um, and I, I personally, you know, when I'm building a new relationship with the client, I feel like, oh my gosh, you're not my only client. You're not my only, the only person that I'm working with, but we have to make them feel like they are to some extent. And I say that from the, from the headspace of, I want them to know that I really care about the work that I'm doing. And so you can only do that by being in community with people. It's not about the papers you've written or how well you can speak or how dynamic your presentations on paper look. It, you know, at the end of the day, that stuff doesn't, it does matter, but that's not what's gonna pull people to you. Um, do you would you like to field Fiona's um, questions at large? Yes, yeah, thank you. And that's also a great question. So uh, Fiona asked, and Fiona, I'm just going to uh, read your question again for everybody. And she asked, um, can you comment about any risk you see in terms of development funding of pushing back about evaluation in ways that I discussed in this presentation? And what I was, basically what I discussed is consistent priorities, program priorities. And again, why, what Emily discussed, what Sylvia brought up here, time, the element of time that uh, the budget, the timelines are shrinking, and that is something that is a big deterrent to evaluation capacity building. And what I see, not exactly risk, there could be risk, but opportunities is that we need to see our outcomes. We need to learn to see our outcomes in different ways. If we want, if we want to be um, aware about, mindful about time, we have to change our habit of crafting our outcomes in a way that suit our actual sheet or our log frames. They need to be much more broad, much more immersive, and of course, much more bottom up. So yes, there are risks because, I mean, donors cannot control the timelines and that is the big risk about development funding. The there is other one is that currently there is a very high focus on efficiency in our outcomes and that's why the timelines we need to relearn or revisit the concept of efficiency and what do we mean by it? And that is also, again, I, I take it back to decolonization because efficiency, the perfection that we expect currently from this work is very top down, very global, North centric, very Western centric. So this, this is something that we need to rethink in, in terms of funding. And also about, you know, we keep on thinking about the priorities or purposes, but not the people. The development funding is all about purpose, but not people. And that's the big disconnect I'm finding. And if when we say that we want broad line funding, basically we need to know that people will intervene. They will have different ideas. So there has to be a long process. We have to give time for that. And we need to take this risk also about look what emily said about building partnership giving time to build those partnership and that is also one risk or one one opportunity and what i realized and what i heard from participants in this research is that many donors are actually already implementing this sorts of um this different kind of funding so it's not like everybody wants to be with this very boxed logic frame oriented uh, outcomes and funding guidelines, many, many funders and global Northwest funders also. And there, and there are funders global south, so it's about matching perspective, not exactly the location. But there are funders who want to change the way that this funding is being given. So there are, I would see that the risk and opportunities in both ways. But yes, it is an important question. Thank you. Thank you for that. I, I was thinking about the difference and there's a book I can't think of author or title at the moment, but there is a book out there about 
foundations that uh, don't require any kind of evaluation, like just, they choose strategically who they want to do whatever, and they just give the money without this, you know, without a, a real evaluation of is it doing what they expected to do or they learning anything from it. And of course, there are those that it, it is like it is just a part of who they are and how they how they function in terms of how they uh, award funding. And it reminded me of the of one of the things my graduate uh, school advisor told me um, a long time ago. Um, she said that uh, sometimes there there isn't always a theory to help explain why we should do something. But if it is a good thing to do, then you should just do it. Um, and so I think that comes along, you know, I, I have to also ask myself when I am being critical of organizations who are not evaluating um, how they are, um, you know, spending their, uh, what their initiatives are, you know, are they, are, are they doing something good? And is it helping somebody? And I think I, I asked myself that because I have to just be okay with the fact that there could be doing harm and we just don't know because they're not doing an evaluation. So I kind of assess like, what are their priorities? What is their history? Um, and so I think that that's something that is also relevant here because you know we're not, we're not going to, to change all these organizations in our lifetime. And we're not going to be able to break down all these barriers in our lifetime, but I do think that we have to find a way to to find some positives to keep us going because this can be very, very, very taxing work. Other questions, thoughts, reactions. We have twenty two minutes, I think, or maybe more. I had a question for that much. Um, Thanks for your presentation. I was wondering um, if there are civil society organizations right now um, in the states of India that, that you were um, doing research that are interested in this issue and trying to provide the service or kind of um, fill the gap of access to um, evaluation services for community-based organizations. Yes, there are. So there is community of evaluators in South Asia. So this is like a, um, they have a VOPE, Voluntary Association, Professional Association for Evaluators, and they do have many resources. Then there is Institute, uh, Indian Institute of Social Sciences, which uh, they, they conduct evaluation training. They have online courses. But most of this, and what one of the findings that from much from my studies, most of this happened on like personal level. People, evaluators, researchers, experienced activists who are in, involved in this, they organizations reach out to them and they give their time voluntarily for building evaluation capacity. And many organizations, because I was working with small grassroots organizations, they said that. Networking, that's why networking becomes very important for us because most of our evaluation work happens through networking. So they invite these experienced people to join their project advisory committees or their board of trustees. And then these people in purely voluntary fashion provide their expertise to this organization and build their evaluation systems, guide them to the evaluation project. So this is a good thing that people, you know, there is a vibrant voluntary culture and people want to help. But on the other hand, other hand, this is also a limitation because these people don't have to do all of this in a voluntary, on a voluntary basis. So it's it's like a mixed bag. But that's what that's what I realized. Other and there questions? is also one question in the chat. I see. Yeah, go for it. Yeah. So the question about what are evaluation lesson learned from studies conducted by researchers within institutions within India? And I, I, I didn't really um, understand it. So I would, I would like to know more about these questions. About if, do you want to explain that to me? I, I didn't really get what you want to ask. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon, excellent presentation. There are fantastic institutions in India doing exemplary work. Then replicated 
in many other parts of the world. The question is, nothing really new. What lessons do you learn based on the challenges and opportunity by faculty researchers within Indian institutions uh, that could help you moving forward? If you're familiar with some of the work done in India by faculty members within teaching to be culturally relevant within India universities, uh, what lessons have you learned based on your review of their work? So I would, I would take this question for evaluation capacity building because that's what really my focus was uh, in this study. And the lesson learned through my research, and one of this is this, the network, one of is there is great need for regional level resources, trainings at regional level, collaborations at regional level, also, it needs to be accessible to majority of development workers, majority of development workers are field workers, frontline workers who work in towns and villages and evaluation trainings, evaluation resources are not available for them. They're available only in the metro cities that results in high urban bias. So we need to take evaluation where the social development, social change happen, and that is at the grassroots. And the way to do it is to create collaboration with regional universities, with collab, take the less uh, um, trans material and create material in local languages. The other thing is that what organizations are doing right now, and that is maybe interesting part to build evaluation is that one that I discussed is that they try to tackle this problem through networking, through strategic networking, inviting people. Secondly, they try to create, in, integrate the evaluation work in their program planning work. So it doesn't have to be, so even though they don't have any separate evaluation or research teams, they try to have evaluation platforms in their program platform so that they can discuss and improve evaluation as a part of program activity because that programs are budgeted. They get funding and then it is easier for them to integrate evaluation in their, yeah, in their work. And thirdly, most of the people do work with Local, there are local evaluators who do work with them. And these are the people that, so I talked about what are the new competencies that people looked in the evaluators? How that is it changing? And, and it is the good news is this is changing that earlier the evaluator used to come only at the end of the uh, project period, evaluate, give report and go back. They were acting as external reviewers. Now the role of evaluators have changed, even in, in India and, and in many global South countries, they see evaluators as capacity builders, resource people, and they expect them to walk them, walk with them throughout the process to help their capacity. And many of the evaluators are now have now changed their role and are you know kind of adjusting to this new role. They are now more of a resource people and they work with the teams, they give trainings, and this is a big, big shift in thinking in terms of what who evaluators are. And these are some of the lessons that emerge from, I mean, there are, there are others too, but I think these are some of the main key points, takeaway points from my research. Thank you so much. Emily, that's a question for you in the chat. Yeah, so happy to answer. So Fiona's asking um, that the organization we worked with had been doing quantitative evaluation. Um, so we, when we met with them, we had a lot of planning meetings to figure out what they um, wanted and what they wanted to learn and, ha and how they would use any evaluation moving forward. And what they really had wanted, um, since they're such a, um, an organization that does a lot of policy advocating, um, so they wanted the qualitative piece um, so they could use that to potentially um, share it to policymakers um, with the community that they work in. So. I'm not sure what, the, I think a lot of their quantitative um, pieces were for um, fund, like the funding that they get for monitoring and, you know, the number of folks that go through their program and maybe some like satisfaction pieces. Um, but I, what I think the next steps for this organization is to really take what they learned um, and, and build their own, use it how they want it. Um, so I'm not sure I necessarily have what I think their next steps would be, because I think our hope was that they would take it. Um, um, and do with it what they what they think is best for them and how they really want to to use um, any sort of qualitative data that they um, that they learn from their programs and, and stakeholders and communities. 
Um, and we are there for, so the next part of the question is um, if we're still there for them. And we, of course, like we, we love working with them. We built this relationship and we of course um, said, you know, if they have questions, if they have comments, um, if they, you know, just wanna share things that they've done, we're for sure there for them um, for like one-off things. If there is a piece that, you know, that they're unsure of or, you know, whatever, we're happy to, to work with them, um, you know, in a, in a I don't want to say like short time period, but I, that is the truth because we can't like provide services to them for free for forever. Um, so I think we're there for them in the sense that like, I, you know, I would be happy to spend a couple hours um, with them. And I'm, I think my boss would also allow me to do that. And we still want to have that relationship with them. Um, so, but yeah, we, we want to work with as many um, different seed communities too as possible. And we, and since we do have to like make sure that as an organization we have that budgeted time, yay capitalism. Um, <laughs> so that's how I would answer that one. Thank you. Great questions, Fiona. Other questions, other thoughts? I just wanted to, not exactly a question, but Emily, what you were just talking about just um, reinforced for me in some ways, some of the parallels between evaluation work and other forms of research, qualitative research, where there are these ethical dilemmas around closing the research or, um, you know, the term exiting the field, which is problematic. I think in, from what you describe, um, I'm just wondering how you have wrestled with and if it's been part of your team's conversations about how you close that evaluative relationship, especially there are these issues of capacity within your organization to continue providing services. And, um, and it's, it really is, is, seems like a transition in some ways out of a relationship or to a new phase of a relationship that in some ways may be artificial or not reflective of where you'd like the work to continue. So I was just wondering how you navigate those ethics and, and dilemmas. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, so tell me if I'm answering your question or not, but I think the way we think of it is like, we want to build the relationship in the end to where we work ourselves out of, of yeah, of really needing to be a part of the, um, like needing to be a part of the evaluation services so that ultimately like they take it on themselves and are able to um, continue it without any of our, um, of our input or, you know, any, I mean, anything that we, we just want them to be able to take it and run with them however they want to. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that makes sense. Other questions, I'm looking at my notes, so um, just give me a second, but folks feel free to jump in. So one of the things that has happened on many projects that um, we've worked on at DIR, one of my team members, Natalia Ibanez, is, is on the call today, um, where funders ask for an evaluation that is, let's say, of a five-year grant, but the, the evaluation is a three-year contract, um, and or it starts a year after um, a year after the work has begun. Um, so I'd like to hear about others' experience with, with um, how do you respond to these kinds of requests? And I'll tell you how, how we respond at DIR, but I'm interested to see how people respond to those kinds of requests. No response. <laughs> That is a response. <laughs> Yana, were you going to add something? I'm actually here. Um, I, I just laughed when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Laugh in their face. <laughs> yeah, that worked too. <laughs> I must admit, I, can I just, I had a, I had a, um, 
group of tribal leaders who called me in six months after they'd started uh, a project to continue an evaluation relationship. And uh, I, I arrived and they were all sitting around the table, the chief executives, and they said, oh, um, we'd like you to pick up this evaluation. And I said, well, what the heck? You know, I don't like coming in part way through. I like coming in at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, oh, well, we had another evaluator. And I go, well, what happened? And they go, well, they didn't get us. So we'd like you to come in now. And I went, oh, you don't get me. This is going to yeah. cost. <laughs> and, and one of them said, I knew she was going to say that. <laughs> So I think capitalism comes in at that point, too. Eh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Punish them. Punish them by making them pay. Absolutely. I do not believe we should do this work for free. Um, and I just, I say that as a person that really cares about what we do, but I do feel like part of shifting the mindsets of folks who say they care about this work, they have to understand that it takes time. Um, and there has to be self-care built into your timeline. I'm not charging my clients for me going off eating bonbons, but I, I do charge them for the, 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 th the time that I spend thinking about their work. Um, and I'm efficient and I'm fair, but I definitely think that it's, it's something that um, we're not always in a position to say no, because sometimes we, we need the work, we need, the, we need to keep our staff busy. Um, but I'll share this and see if Natalia wants to add anything. I, um, we were on a call recently with the client and the contract is coming to an end. Um, and we're at, on a tail end of a multi-year um, evaluation that does align with the grant period. Um, but there's still so much more to learn. And I basically asked them about their commitment to doing additional evaluation um, because if they stop at the end of this period, it sends the wrong message. It, 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 it counters the message they've been sending to their grantees all along, which is we really want to help you document what you're learning. Um, and we really care about the longer term outcomes of this work. Um, and so I said to them, like, you know, I don't know what your thinking is, but you should be thinking about it. And the best thing for you to do is to extend this contract with us because we've put in the blood, sweat and tears to develop the relationships. And, and, I, and I also said, maybe I shouldn't say this, but I really don't care how you take it. And I'm like, you would be really silly not to continue to engage with us. Um, and that is, it was not a selfish DIR, DIR needs more work because we're really busy. Uh, but it's really about like the learning is not done here and we can, how can we, how can we strike that balance? Because we know funds aren't endless, um, but I just think that we have to put ourselves out there and, and, and make it known that, you know, this is, this is detrimental potentially to the work and to the initiative of a, of a, of a key focus area. If this is the pattern, all we fund work three year, five year cycles, we evaluate it and we move on. And sit it on a shelf. So I don't know, Natalia, if you want to add anything about the, those kind of exchanges that we've been having. Not to put you on the spot. No, no. I, well, I just, I, yeah, I, I agree. It takes it takes time to build knowledge, and and once you have done so, it, we need to keep keep building on it. And and it's hard for it's hard to find a compromise between funders have a definite amount of money for it but they also want more knowledge so we we just need to find ways so that we can both work together and and we can continue to advance that knowledge on that specific project yeah. you know what can i can i butt into conversation Please. You, you know you know what but this is also one of the capitalist inherent capitalist characteristic because funders want organizations to produce knowledge. And many times in the context of India, they want like full-fledged RCTs and RCTs take time, so, but funders were not interested in investing that time and money it requires to build the system to implement mm -hmm. a meaningful RCT. I mean, even if in the RCT paradigm, a good RCT. So what happens that organizations who have previously developed this framework or, or you know, uh, some of this uh, infrastructure, they keep getting new projects. 
and organizations who had recently started work, who are doing really good com community work, but they don't have this infrastructure already built in in their organizations, they don't get their work. So it's like, so people used to say that there are this high class organizations and low class organizations, high class organizations who have infrastructure, they keep getting new programs, new projects, all funders want them. And meanwhile, the, the new people are, who, even if they're doing really good work, they can't, they can't get funding because they don't have this research infrastructure built in and they can't make funders do it. So it then perpetuates the gap. We're all shaking our heads, yes. And those who are uh, whose cameras aren't off, I know you're shaking your heads, yes, too. Um, go ahead, Fiona. I say, do you think? I mean, my my example about the the tribal CEOs. You know, I'm I'm really happy for people to try other evaluation approaches. You know, I think that there's one thing about being in relationship. There's another thing about trying something new. Right. and extending yourself to another evaluation group, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, I think it, it, it can make people realise that uh, the relationship they've had with, say, you, you Emily, and Seed, you know, that, that's special. They might not find that somewhere else. And I think there's something about um, organisations being given a little bit of autonomy mm -hmm. to say who they want to work with. Mm -hmm. which I think actually might solve the problem of uh, funders choosing to break or to proceed with a long-term relationship or choose a bigger organisation over a little one. Mm -hmm. you no, know, if we give more, more say, self-determination to organisations to pick an evaluator or an evaluation capacity builder. Yeah, no, I appreciate that, that perspective. I mean, I think that you know, when I think about how we engage and respond to RFPs around evaluation, we are, we, we are all, almost never do we go in without some kind of a collaboration or partnership. Um, new client, existing client. Um, that said, though, we are cautious about how we engage with the funder. Um, because as a small organization with a deep history with our clients, um, you know, we're flexible, we're adaptive, we try to be proactive, but we can also be reactive all in the same one hour meeting. And, and that's not something that a large organization can always provide just because of bureaucracy, infrastructure, whatever. But that can come at a cost too for us because then we get pulled in deeper and then those lines get blurred. Are you the third party evaluator? Are you an extension of your funder? And how do you strike that balance? How do you pull things back in? I think it, I really appreciate working with people who want to work with me. I don't like working with people who don't want to work with me. Like who likes that? Um, but the ones that do like to work with me, like they, you know, I, I tend to give, I tend to donate a little bit more time, but when I'm doing that across multiple clients, multiple projects, it can be challenging. So I, I, I think at least for me, I, I will say um, that when I'm working with my clients directly, they definitely have an affinity to, so they have a tendency to pull towards, I, I want to hear from Sylvia. I want to, we have meetings where it's these numbers are squares on the screen and they're talking directly to me. And I am intentional about, okay, Natalia, you need to talk about X. So once I need to talk about X because especially foundations, they have their favorites and they don't really want to deal with developing a relationship with someone else. Um, but that too is part of, I think, the, the socializing that we have to do um, just so that we can, if, if they know that we're authentic, then they do give us that space to do what we were hired to do. If they don't know us, then they're hovering and that is not ever good for a third party evaluator. So um, we are nearing the end of time. So I just wanna see if there are any other thoughts. I've, I've really enjoyed this conversation this afternoon. I'm told I'm supposed to wait like 30 seconds, but I never can. 
I know I'm supposed to be safe with silence and I, I just, I'm sorry. Let me try again. Let me try for 10 seconds. Okay, that's all I got. I see some new cameras coming on. So Scott, or I know Rosetta was our moderator. Were you guys coming on to say hello or to add something? Nope. Yeah, I was just going to speak okay. and say great session. Enjoyed it. Okay. Thank you much. Thank you for the feedback. Thank you for the Thank feedback. you. Thank you. So I, good luck with this work. I mean, I think we got to keep get up and try again the next day. And uh, to the extent that what we're learning across these uh, organizations and our projects that we do some peer sharing, um, we love to engage with just group thought sharing across, even with our biggest competitors. You know, I, I try to meet with them at least once a quarter to say, hey, how are you doing? Um, because I like to know that if we lose to someone that who they got is is um, uh, is good. Um, so part of how, how I access that is just like, oh, let me be your friend. And, but it's authentic. It's not just to get intel. Um, so I hope that um, you guys have taken something away from this session. Thank you so much to the presenters and for your attention today. I hope to see some of your faces on another session between this afternoon and tomorrow. Bye.